if you are listening on YouTube, you can probably understand everything a lot better. Oh, it was a link. Uh, thank you very much to Kevin for fixing the audio. Um, yes, I will share. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, the first thing, same as yesterday, oh, would somebody mind closing the door? Um, first thing, same as yesterday, yeah, if the aircon's not on, then that could be good to turn on as well. Uh, same as yesterday, uh, opportunity for anyone who has thoughts about stuff we covered in the first two days that have come up um, to rehash and, and bring up before we get into the main session. Uh, I have one actually about everyone's favourite topic, dispute resolution. <laughs> um, I've been thinking about um, you know the, the goal being to build a second layer solution that acts as if it was intended to be a first layer solution. And one of the questions I have is how practical it is from the point of view of charging people for disputes uh, and of, of building a robust appeals process and all that sort of thing. Um, do we think it's actually reasonable to charge people for a disputes process that is only a voluntarily opt-in thing, even if most clients choose to, to opt their users into it by default? Um, and, and can we really build an organisation that, you know, takes as much due diligence as you would if it was like ICANN and the DNS? Because if, if you look at the typical sort of volunteer run free disputes thing with something like mail, then you get spam house and it's not really as effective. I have a suggestion for how we can not have that problem then, yeah. which is to only we had a namespacing solution. But if uh, if we namespace the the, the dispute lists of, of or the block lists, then our system just is one namespace of block lists that you can subscribe to. And then, wait. So, I, so, so our, our volunteer list or whatever. Yeah. Are you our, saying our, like a thousand flowers bloom sort of thing? Uh, more like if somebody else wants to create a different one, right? Then they can create it under a different namespace. But this is pretty much saying give up on the idea of trying to build a second layer solution that can eventually be a first layer solution. No, wait, wait, no. I think the whole point of building a second layer solution. Uh, so the interesting thing about building a second layer solution is that you're not actually doing dispute resolution, right? You're at least you're not trying to figure out who is the owner. Because as a second layer, the only thing you can really do in practice is block some domains from the access. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm basically right. copying the ad block model, which is you can subscribe to different ad block lists. Right, but which the, one block? the conclusion I thought we came to on Monday was was first that. A dispute resolution system, sorry, on Friday. Uh, a dispute resolution system that can only block stuff is a valid dispute resolution system. Yes. And also that we were going to try and build it as if it could, you know, with the goal of, of eventually integrating it if it's successful. Yes. But, yeah, but that has nothing to do with how things necessarily get into it. But I think it does because if you talk, I mean, I, I think most people would be unhappy with a spam house style approach as a first layer. Solution. Well, right, but spam house is one group. Well, no, but I mean, I mean, block has like a hundred lists, and so people right. might subscribe to the new list. Right. So, so I can talk a little bit about like the how we're doing the list and curating the list if you want. Um, I'd like to hear it, but just yeah. one second. Okay. But, but then. A, a, a choose from any of a dozen list solution cannot be a first layer solution because the whole point yeah. of the first layer solution is that it is potentially okay. removed. Okay, okay. so I, so I, <coughs> my point is instead of having the thing that we will find one second layer solution, ideally, I think that we should try many second layer solutions. List should probably okay. have its own block blocking list. Mu should have its own blocking list, and it can have with a different yeah. I, I'm, fine, I'm, fine, I'm fine with that, but I thought the conclusion we came to on Friday was that <coughs> we would use a, a, an initially second layer solution as a, a, an experiment for building one into the into the yeah, so maybe this is the one that many, many flowers, flowers bloom. Right, but what I'm saying is you can't let many flowers bloom in the first layer because the, the you can only have one blacklist at the first layer. So, so like maybe you build the build the ability and how to make the blacklist, and then like they get one, we get one. And um, I'm also not sure that a first layer black 
list solution is exactly right because of the like jurisdictional thing. No, I agree. That that at a certain level, like I IP things happen at first layer, like redistribution of names and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But blacklisting is a is more subjective. But they do because like um, you know you, you can get phishing wallets, uh, you know phishing sites blacklisted on dot com, for instance. Right. So maybe this experiment I isn't. See, I can see both sides. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I guess my point is that the. The solutions we seem to be gravitating to for a second layer solution seem inappropriate for a first layer one, and there are some that are really so the, the many flowers bloom thing is inappropriate. Okay, yes. so they can I don't necessarily it. agree that we can't find a way to pay our workers. No, I, I'm, I'm confused why, that but the I, dispute resolution started talking about blacklists. How are the two related? Um, the, right. So based on our conversation on Friday, the, the, there can be two outcomes of a, of a dispute. You can delete the domain and, and block it. Oh, okay, so or you can reassign it to the blacklist. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they, they, they can be sort of related because yeah. if, if it costs something, if, if it costs you the utility, um, you're, let's say you're trying to scam someone, you buy it, you, you, you try to impersonate someone, and you get blacklisted, suddenly your job as impersonator isn't very useful. The best thing you can do is release the name. And anyone that tries to buy that name and is not the legitimate owner will be will still be on the Yeah, they get paid, I mean, they'll pay for it afterwards. Because basically they'll get they'll buy a domain that got blacklisted and then it will still be blacklisted until somebody takes it off. Exactly. And, uh, and then the moment that the the rightful owner is able to buy it, they can try to appeal the process and get it removed from the backlist. So it's a good way to get eventually the owner to get there, it. There won't be actually, I don't think, economic incentive for the owner to try and get the the fishing domains. Like I, I know a couple of guys on the Apple abuse desk and they're like, and all they do all day long is chase down the fishing domains. Like, your problem to the end. And they're like, <laughs> so when you show up on our system, I'm like, do you want the domains? They're like, Mark, if we took every infringement, like if Apple registered every one of these, like we'd be out of business. You know, it's like that many. So you just the best yeah, place to leave. I still don't mind that because typo domains, you know, like I would take all of those. Some of the obvious yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. Like we should sure. pay, pay for them. And I think, yeah, yeah so we took myinkawallet.co, for example, like that's one that I, I did actually like want so that I didn't have to worry about it in the future because it is just so similar. Uh, but like, you know, my wallet with a C instead of an E, like, it meh, feels like we're you know, the type of ones, yeah. meh. There's too many typos. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Kind of but I mean, there's too many typos a lot, right? Typos are ordered by press members, right? Oh, so, yeah, yeah. That's like, how do you get traffic on all the numbers and all the titles? So, yeah, you can figure it out. I imagine it's doable, but yeah. It might be a little tedious. Well, <laughs> they, have a, they have like an algorithm. Like, they, so basically, my email has like two, three actually separate like things, but one of them is that uh, we have like maybe. Like it's not they're not phishing sites, they're like they're like ad sites. And it's like they they just have a whole bunch of typos, there's maybe a hundred of them. Those are all the DNS all ones. So, so, and yeah. it's like automatic and it's crazy and those just get registered. Uh, so just to clarify, what, what I'm saying is that not that Taylor would want to buy every misspelling of my email yeah. wallet. Mm -hmm. Just saying that if yeah, every if, you they want if, that list. Yeah. It's, it's like a random user buying a new like yeah. a domain that got but, released by Fish. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 my no, point no. is that if she bought if, if the owner of my if released it, she was probably the only one who, who, who could sure. buy but, it. But this is, from the black I, from I agree, so that's fine. We any system would need a way to take stuff off the blacklist. Yeah, but, but my point is that it's just by blocking it, you're also making this good process in a way that at some point the, the rightful owner eventually owns. Yes, I mean, I think our conclusion on Friday was that just blocking gets you about 80% of the way to an, an ideal dispute process. The other 20% would be some way to reassign names in the root, but that we were reasonably happy with the solution that only blocked initially. Yeah, and I'm interested in seeing how this progresses. Like, I'm very interested in, in seeing what types of problems we actually encounter in the real world. Like, is it primarily phishing, or is it primarily like, as Ethereum becomes more popular, brands, you know, that were, you know, someone else registered are looking for their names. So that, you know, the value in 
and doing the second layer solution isn't necessarily that we're going to take it and put it on the first layer, but I would say the real value is determining what types of problems of, you know, are most common and how hard those problems are to solve. Because if we you know, anticipate all these hypotheticals that seem impossible or nearly impossible to solve, but the reality is, is like we have five cases of fishing domains where it's like a non-decision. You know, maybe this is just something that we don't have to deal with yet. So you're saying um, build the the second layer solution, not to be structurally identical to, to a permanent solution, but to be suitable for gathering experience with what sort of disputes are handled and, and how they resolve. Well, and then also inform whether or not it's a reasonable thing. Uh, like, we may learn that this isn't a reasonable thing. Like, we may learn that maintaining a blacklist and uh, that actually causes more problems due to, like, back and forth or, you know, the subjectivity of it. You know, we may learn that it's not, it's a non-issue. We may learn that, you know, majority of the issues that we spend the most time on are a few cases. There's all these sorts of things that we can use. And, you know, when we're talking about a first layer solution, I don't think that like a, a you know, curated blacklist is gonna be a first layer solution. I don't think that's realistic. But uh, maybe the first layer solution is just like uh, some processes that enable, you know, um, like a structure for, you know, moving from the second layer blacklist into, you know, like the filing process, the dispute process, like that would only be the first layer. You know, and it would be like a, like they, they work in tandem, and so the first layer would just be enabling the second layer to be more permanent or on the first layer. So what you're saying is that even though a blacklist isn't a good first layer solution, the mm -hmm. process in which we judge a blacklist can be a great learning experience for whatever process we put in the first layer. Okay. Yeah. Research to be my right. I may have heard later on what we should actually. I mean, I, I don't think a blacklist necessarily is a bad first layer solution. It might not be a complete one, but ultimately, mm -hmm. delisting fishing domains is just a valid version of a blacklist. Yeah. Right. Well, and that's the thing. Is like maybe the maybe the first layer solution is something more like where you do have the second layer that has these you know more custom lists, and maybe like you know we at Micro Wallet uh, are more like, you know, we, 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 uh, like we, just, we block first and ask questions later. And maybe Miss takes the approach that uh, you have to prove X, Y, Z, you know, and, and from those two different experiences, we can then like learn what works and uh, also learn, you know, maybe like, I would imagine that the best solution may be that the first layer, if it's a blacklist, like would be something that, um, like the cross section of two lists. So like if I have it on my list, MetaMask has it on their list, you have it on your list, like we can be reasonably sure that that's a legitimate thing. Like well, that's, that's uh, the Hold on, thing. but I mean like wouldn't, like wouldn't Mr. or uh, Amir be just arbiters uh, in some kind of uh, dispute process, well, but then they would have their own empirical data to bring to make those decisions? Right, well so, okay, so mm -hmm. as a, like okay, so when we're talking about blacklist for ENFs, right, we have to like make decisions that are uh, like we have to have some process in place. As my Ether wallet, like we should have some process in place, but also like I can just go ban the world if I want to. Like that's, you know what I mean? Like that's my choice as a company. Sure. Right. So right. Right. I think right. that right. what may right. happen is that everyone, like the level of subjectivity or the level of the approach that individual, you know, clients take or how they implement this blacklist or whatever may inform you know, the best sort of, um, it may improve the best process for determining a blacklist on, on the ENS layer, or it may prove that, like, uh, it's more trouble than it's worth. And yeah, uh, it, uh, I still feel like you can import that, that information through you being a decision maker. Absolutely. And I think we already have, like, some process in place for the current vision setting, how we, how we deal with them, and how we give the community information that that's there. And, like, part of that is, like, we have a lot of the community that is, like, looking out for these things. And so it's, like, we have consensus from more than just us right now, right. which is great. Um, and the thing is, like, um, I, I feel like we have an okay system in place, but it's, like, with the, if the, the DNS thing, it's like it's a little, it's a, a little bit less of a big deal at this moment. Mm -hmm. So it's a good time to experiment with kind of both uh, maybe more aggressive and less aggressive ways of handling these blacklists. And like the thing about releasing uh, domains after like a fish or whatever releases them 
is that um, once they realize that they can release them and buy them back in fish again, like that. Uh, I think that there, there will be a huge revolution mm -hmm. for removing it from the blacklist. Well, yeah. The thing is that it, it, that would only start after like you bought them, like the yeah. owner so bought we, them, and they could. So we would need the basically we at that point we need the dispute resolution, um, like our like blacklisting and how we get that like who we blacklist to a point where we can actually determine that we're giving the domain to the right or like the person that owns the domain is the correct owner of that domain. Yeah, but that's, 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 that's all of that. Maybe yes. just the first person who comes to you and says, can you please take me off the black? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just wait and see. It's, it's the same yeah. process, right? Right. And that's the thing is that in these types of things, we imagine all of these edges are Oh, what if someone emails you that doesn't actually own the domain? Like, <laughs> let's talk about for five hours a process for making them verify that they own the domain. In reality, nobody's gonna fake okay, like you know owning a domain that they don't. Like you know, the yeah. fishes just well, don't see that. Well, it's no, okay. So in general, like that's not true. But I will say that like a fisher, in my experience. Fishers do not reach out to you and ask you to like remove them from the whitelist. <laughs> the yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they just they, they don't care because it's easier. Yeah, they tend to not like, 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 not. They literally like it is easier for them to just buy a new domain. Yeah. Okay, and that's what they do. There's some out there. So, so the spectrum of opinions I see right now is obviously like multi-layer, second-layer solutions. Maybe event, you know, as an experimental space. Maybe merging them. Maybe that's a simple union where where everybody who's currently got a blacklist just has full uh, autonomy. I personally think that that's very unlikely to be like a sustainable solution for a first layer thing. Mm -hmm. Just because if you have a, a shoot first, ask questions later thing, and uh, especially because like for example, Mew has more of a worn uh, system right now, so your blacklist actually means less when on right. that. Once you merge that in there, suddenly we're blocking that page. Right. right, so that page that you know was maybe not a phishing site, but was more kind of a CD seeming ICO. Now we're like blocking people out of fundraising. Like, I, I like I would want at least a second signer on something like that. Well, that's so, right. also why the why the multiple like them having one, you guys having one, and us having one, and appro us like approaching it differently. Like that's the one piece of things that we kind of want to keep a little bit separate. Is that like we want. Miss to approach the way that Miss is going to approach your mom, and yeah. ask to approach it the way that you guys are going to approach it, and we want to approach with right. The only but, problem is, is that like nobody, I don't even want to maintain lists, and now I'm maintaining lists. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's kind of what I want to think about, like this, these like dispute resolution slash oracle systems. What I'm really thinking about is like, hey, let's make a like a like a cool mechanism and have like a thousand or ten thousand nerds show up. Right. To so play, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. let's yeah. let me let me have just them curate the yeah, okay, so let's talk about what we're doing right now, because this is like as of two weeks ago, it's kind of crazy. Okay, so we have Ether Address Lookup, which is a Chrome extension that literally this guy Harry built for me because I wanted to be able to collect from the support emails. People don't link to their uh, addresses, so I was like, can you make it so that any address anywhere on the internet is clickable? And so we made this extension, and it works, and it's pretty useful. And like right around the same time as I was launching, we had this fishing problem. And I was like, hey, quick question. Uh, can you implement like a blacklist system so that people stop going to fishing URLs? And like literally that was it. So that extension, either address lookup, is now like this anti-phishing extension cool. that has a list. Then MetaMask is using that same list from that repo. And then we have the Levenstein <coughs> scheme, whatever, distance algorithm. So that we don't actually have to like add every URL. Like if you add like a URL, uh, let's say it's like a fake like uh, oh my spell right URL, you would add the real oh my spell to the whitelist to make sure that that was always whitelisted. You have the fake oh my go to the blacklist. Let's say they have oh my dash go dot com and oh my dash go dot net and oh my dash go dot whatever ca. Uh, those would all automatically be blocked from the one. Great. Okay. Now separately, we have the report feature on the EIL. So the report feature was built by another guy, Louis, who was also the guy that built the uh, the cool spam the fishers uh, with fake private keys, which was super cool. Like I don't know if you guys saw that, but like literally he made like a little thing. I ran it for a couple hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was super cool. He spent <laughs> like five million private keys that were just like fake. Like it was super awesome. Uh, oh, how do you? They were taking private keys. 
So the fishing size, like basically. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Got it. So. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what face is the base known one? So just emailing that sounds like one email per submission. Yeah. <laughs> So they were entirely manually processing and dropping keys. They just got an inbox full of like emails and private keys with no funds behind them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah it was so it was super so fun. Cool. It was like yeah. a really easy little tool. And uh, so then he built this thing that's called Ether Scam DB. And so that site is basically just a database of uh, like scams. And like the thing is that we don't just do like my Ether wallet. You, we do the fake ICO websites. We'll do the really blatant. Fake, and this is like something we've been talking about is how do you handle those like ICOs that are maybe fake and maybe just a scam or maybe just a bad idea? Uh, like, you know, where like I don't really want to be the one that determines like whether or not you should invest in an ICO, but uh, you know, in the case that you have an ICO with uh, a team page that's literally stolen, you know, with mis mismatched names, uh, where you like, have a, you have a picture of someone that's like from like ISOC photo, what like a random name that doesn't something? have any history anywhere. Like, you know, what, how do we, what do we do? So that's happening. So that's something that, you know, we're trying to figure out how we handle this. But basically with this thing, you can report, uh, they, it'll automatically like pull every, I don't know, X amount of hours and see if it's online or offline. Uh, and then it hooks into, I don't know if it's automatic yet, but um, it, uh, it'll pull like all the who is information for you automatically and then and this way, I say I don't know if it automatically does this yet, or we're still manually like pushing it. But <coughs> it'll email like takedown requests and like abuse reports to the information the who it is. So that's super cool. And then every time we get a report, uh, we webhook into our Slack. So basically, we get like a, a thing that says like, "Hey, you just got a report for this this uh, website, you know." And then we can add that to the blacklist manually, or we could do another webhook somewhere, or whatever. Um, Oh, and then the other thing that's really cool with the, the Chrome extension is that uh, we can actually find new phishing sites that are active based on the fact that people are visiting them and getting and getting blocked. That's cool. And because of the eleven sheen whatever distance, and so then you can put nice. that back into the reporting one and have them automatically ever take down the file. That sounds really cool. Yeah. So that's how we're doing things. And uh, so, so about the eleven sheen distance, I mean. So that's a bit, I mean, I'm assuming it's like number of misspells, yeah. like with like shifts and spaces, right? It's so like, uh, do you it's know like, how it works? It's like number of characters that print or something. It's yeah. Like okay. and then that's... So, so here's like an idea that I had. And it would be cool if you could, for 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 an industry, like pay Norm to have a bigger radius of what is gene names mm -hmm. reserved, mm -hmm. uh, right? But <laughs> 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 the shorter, but the shorter name that you have, the more obviously the more right. you have to pay yeah, because it's more. It's quite a lot of really bad names in there, right? But with a long name, having um, you know, a few typos, like maybe it could be a relatively small batch of names in the scheme of things, right? And you like not, you're like, you know, you, you reserve your name and like kind of blacklist like a ball. I, 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 like, I like the idea, like uh, my Taylor's approach where you whitelist some names and then you can you can like blacklist everything. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it's that, that that's part of first list. 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 It's, Reasonable for long hands. Yeah, but that, that can be short hands. You just buy them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, I, 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 also I, I, like I block, block everything. That is, if I know that a name is legitimate, yeah. I block everything that is not. Or at least I alert the user asking, "Are you sure you don't want to go?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's cool as a second layer. I just thought that you also. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how this, is the this, is, this is jumping in some of the stuff I was going to talk about, but that's exactly one of the things that, that was on the list. So we'll give an example of using an ICO. Okay, so ICOs happen. They're not continual, and they're not necessarily common in a certain distance. So what you can do, is, and you can take a, a subdomain, so you know my ICOs or whatever that is, and you can register a name on there. Now, regarding the letters and distance, what you do is you say, well, there can only be one name that currently resolves within a letters and distance. So you can you can have, I don't know. GNT and DNT, so the, the whatever it might be. So you could have GNT dot ICO trust belief and, and DNT dot ICO trust belief, but only one of them is actually allowed to resolve at any one time. The idea of that is that normally, as we say, an ICO is a specific period of time. And over that, two at the same time. You can't have two at the same time. We've done generally. 
Right, good. Well, uh, 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 and, 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 of course, <laughs> and, and of course, that type of thing is always possible, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, we're, 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 it's not meant to be designed to do that, but the big idea that you can do that more specifically in subdomains, comes back to some of the stuff I'm talking about. I mean, the, the general trying to build this generically into something that covers all of ENS is going to be tough. The idea of <coughs> preserving a block of names over, over an area is fantastic. Doing inside the NS is basically impossible already. <laughs> we've got, well, no, because we've already registered a bunch of names, so anything yeah. that useful, you're yeah. already going to crash into collisions. So, I, I'm right. going to call this to a close because mm -hmm. we're running out of time. Yeah. It sounds like the new consensus is uh, to build a layer two solution not as something that can eventually be put into layer one, but in an attempt to gain experience in what sort of disputes happen and how they should be resolved. You're not ruling um, out the idea that we can move to layer one here. Yeah. <laughs> more likely that we would build a new solution in layer one using the lessons we learned from the layer two solutions. Yeah. The, uh, what would be like the you know, actionable things for this layer two thing? What would yeah, be the next uh, I think it would be good to pave a way for a layer one solution. Like, even yeah. if we're saying, look, you want full autonomy, like, if we said, like, look, here's an architecture where you can do it maybe on chain or uh, maybe in, like, some, I don't know, like, we can talk about what that means, but with some path towards that, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I we think we have a lot of hammering out an EIP with what the format of this data looks like. Well, I think step one, and well, but no, it's I'll also just, healthy yeah. that every client, that clients try different approaches. No, no, I'm just I'm saying that sure all of the different that. approaches result in the same data format. Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. That, that anybody, <laughs> can, <laughs> yeah. anybody can populate their list however you want. Let's have a JSON schema for what the yeah. list yeah. looks like. Yeah. 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 And let's talk about it and make sure it's a good one because I have one that we're using and like. And you are. are and like, I feel like maybe from... someone else should like get their input because I just mm -hmm. typed it up mm -hmm. one day. Yeah. So, um, and and then yes, whatever the 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 way that we feed these into like a if we feed them into an on chain registry, is it too much data? Mm -hmm. We just feed in IPFS URIs, whatever. Okay.